<laughs> Good morning. Good afternoon. Welcome to Develop Your Edge with Anthony Crudelli. I'm the co-host, Tom Schneider, CMT with Ninja Trader. And before we get into the good stuff, I do want to remind everybody that futures and options trading contain substantial risk and is not for every trader. You could potentially lose all or even more than all of your initial investment. That's why we recommend using risk capital. What is risk capital? It's money you could afford to lose, doesn't Keep you up at night doesn't extend your retirement horizon. I also want to remind everybody that past performance is not indicative of future results and that what we talk about here in this broadcast contains neither trade recommendations nor financial advice, but should be taken for educational purposes only. And with that out of the way, it is my pleasure to welcome back to the show, of course, Anthony Crudelli. How you doing, Anthony? Good, Tom. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, I had a great trip this week. I was uh, very fortunate to come down to your home state and, or actually your residing state and, and visit your studios and meet with you in person. It was a great time. Uh, you know, thank you for all your generosity, your hospitality. It was awesome. Yeah, no, we had a great time. We had a great lunch. It was a perfect day. And, you know, we talked about markets. We talked about develop your edge. And, you know, I'm excited for today's show because a lot of times you and I will talk and we'll say, okay, what's going on right now in the markets? What can we do to help traders develop an edge, right? What is the current thing that we need to be looking at? And obviously this week we had the FOMC meeting and I put a tweet out and it got quite a bit of traction. And in one of the comments, somebody was talking about how how did I or other pit traders back in the day go into an FOMC meeting? Because my tweet was something like I was playing cards uh, or we would go to long lunches before FOMC. We wouldn't spend all this time preparing. And it's funny, like so many people nowadays are spending so much time trying to guess or anticipate what the Fed is going to do when it's something that's really out of our control, right? I mean, we've got the Fed funds tool. We pretty much have a really good gauge. Uh, of what they're going to do uh, at the meeting. And of course, the presser can always be, who knows, right? I mean, who knows what, what's going to come out of Powell's mouth or what question is going to be asked. Um, but we've gotten used to the guy, so we, we kind of know uh, where they're going to stand. And and so I think I saw so many people spending so much energy on anticipating what the Fed was going to do and and how the markets would react. And and what it does is it develops this, this hidden inner bias. And I feel like that's really a negative on how you want to prepare for a major meeting like a FOMC. I think you want to come in calm. I think you want to come in with no bias. And you want to watch the action, see what happens uh, after the announcement, see what happens during the presser. And of course, that stuff's going to be important, right? But even if I told a lot of the traders out there, probably most of them, exactly what Powell uh, was going to do uh, with the rate cut or rate hike, rate cut, I'm getting ahead of myself. That could be a little later this year, but, uh, and, or what he was going to say in the announcement, it's hard to say that we would exactly know what to do. And I mean, some things obviously could be extreme where if he says, you know what, uh, we're, we're not cutting 25 basis points and, you know, and saw that certain things that uh, are raising 25 basis points uh, or something like that. And, and we're, we're done. And then maybe that would be obviously a big moment. We kind of have an idea of what to happen. But for the most part, if they stay within what expectations are, very unlikely for us to be able to execute very well during a very volatile environment and actually make money with it, even if we know exactly what he's going to do. So the whole thought process is, what do we do coming into a big meeting like an FOMC or even a CPI to prepare? And we're going to discuss that today. And, you know, you, you hit it on the head, like, you know, in recent years, there's been more focus on what the Fed presidents have been see saying, you know, after the meeting or up until the blackout before the meeting with the access to information and so many more distribution channels that people can get their information, like social media, th there's this whole dynamic around, you know, building up these speakers, building up the the, the Fed uh, chairman or chairperson, I should say, and it's almost like they've been elevated to rock star status. So the focus is there, whereas they're just doing the same job they've been doing for how many decades, right? So it's this elevation, these megaphones, I should say, that have been uh, just gotten bigger and, and more prevalent. 
um, that might uh, get people excited, like you said, form a bias that really it might be wiser just to kind of step back and look at a bigger picture. Yeah, you know, I remember there was a guy that I interviewed on my podcast a while back and it was great. And he said, if I told most of the traders listening to this where we're going to close the year, they'd still lose money. <laughs> <laughs> and it was made me laugh so hard. And I said, you know what? Because the path of getting to, to that price is where everything takes place, right? If I told everybody that the market's going to close uh, at X price for certain, you know, 12 months down the road, so much could happen between then, uh, between now and then. And so when you look at it from that perspective, it tells you to what? Be in the now right? Be in what's happening right now because you can have targets, you can have all these things uh, that you're looking at that you think the market could potentially do. But at the end of the day, it's about executing from point A to point B. And if you have something in the back of your mind that you think is going to happen that doesn't really allow you the freedom, the mental freedom to be in the now to execute from A to B because you're only focusing on B now. You're only focusing on the outcome. You're not focusing on the process to get there. And that's why I think spending too much time, and I know right now we're in a world where macro is so important and it really is. And I spend a lot of time with it on my podcast, on my own time. I read something every morning, but that's really just to develop an understanding of what's happening in the market, not for me to develop a hidden bias. Because the minute I sit down, like look at a day like today after yesterday's market, it's hard not to want to come in and be bearish and everything is setting up bullish today. And you say to yourself, well, the Fed did this. I thought they were going to stay higher for longer. Why are we rallying? Well, you know what? The market has short-term memory. And now from today, uh, even though we know what the Fed did do yesterday, today is a different day and we have to execute from A to B. Agreed. Yeah. And and so as a trader, you know, we want to we want to be aware of what's happening on a macro basis, but we also want to kind of step back and say, what are uh, ahead of these news items? How do we prepare that might be different or it might it be the same with what our strategy is? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think we'll, let, let's pull up the charts because I want to get into it a little bit right now. And, and first off, I'm going to show just a tweet that I have. This is the tweet that I put out. And it's crazy. It got almost half a million, over half a million views in just uh, a few days. And there's a ton of comments in there. So if anybody wants to go check it out, it's a lot of good conversations in there. But the the one thing that I want to talk about, obviously, is this question. And I don't know if maybe when we want to pull it up as the Ask DYE, maybe we maybe we showcase that. I mean, I could show it on here, or we could have Jason pull it up because I want to talk about this question. Maybe we do do that. Um, because that that's that's the question that's really bringing us to what the show is today. Right. So uh, on Develop Your Edge, we have an Ask DYE segment, question of the week. You can put a question out to Anthony on Twitter. Just be sure to use the hashtag Ask DYE and include at NinjaTrader there. And if you're in the United States, uh, we will be able to send something nice for your participation. But this week, Sultan of Swing uh, asked the question, what type of levels did you have in mind to place trades before the news back then in the pit? So you're in the pit, you're trading. Uh, what were the levels based on? Were they based on volume profile? Were they based on pivot points? Uh, was there something like book map that showed where passive liquidity was? And how did you know what papers were doing? So a lot of questions in there, but I think overall, how did you know what levels uh, ahead of a, a big news event? Yeah. And, you know, there were so many different ways that traders came into these events um, with some support and resistance levels that they were looking at. Market profile was a big tool back then. People would look for like single tick areas. Uh, and those of you that are familiar with that, like go and fill in some prior single ticks. And you'd have people that would look at you know, just basic support and resistance. They go and look at a chart, mark it up on a marker and go in and say, oh yeah, where we where you know, these are some areas that we would look at. And to be honest with you, it was mostly just kept very, very basic. And one of the things that I started to do was give a lot of the traders that were around us in our circle, my ideas. And that all came through the Bollinger Bands. And I've talked a lot about the Bollinger Bands on here. And so when we look at the charts here, let's pull those up. 
when we look at the charts, one of the things that I started to do was where is their unfinished business? And, and what do I mean by that? I mean, where did the market start to go in a direction and then pull back, but the market maybe didn't make a good high and a good high would be something to where you felt like there was a good, whether it was a capitulation type high, not that you always look for that, but you, you know, a good high or a good low is when, you know, a market does it with some power and then comes off of it. And you're like, wow, that's an area that I think we all step back and say that was an area that we, we feel is a good high or a good low. And what I started to do was I pulled up these Bollinger bands, 20 period, three standard deviation. And what I would go and do, and I would start to look at it on the daily and I'd be like, okay, What's kind of happening here uh, on these Bollinger Bands as we were grinding higher? Now, remember, a Bollinger Band, as a market's going up, and I'm using 20 period, three standard deviation Bollinger Bands, it's doing, it's showing you a three standard deviation move from uh, a 20 EMA, right? And I don't have the the, uh, the moving average in here because I don't, I don't use that. I just look at the Bollinger Band to say, okay, this is how, this is what a three standard deviation move is. Right. And a lot of times when you looked at specifically the S and P, because that's where the pit I was in a three standard deviation move typically was a pretty good high or low. If it were to go up and, and hit that Bollinger band. Right. And then you can go back and look here. Anytime that you touch a, a three standard deviation Bollinger band, um, it, it really does typically come off of it. it. It's not something that where it stays above it for a period of time, right? Where maybe the NASDAQ um, might might give it a little bit more of a <laughs> more of a time period around those areas. But for the S and P, uh, it, it would stay pretty steady um, when you would see it hit that it would come off it. So I would just use that as my standard deviation and say if we got to that point, um, we probably could look for some sort of a good higher low that was made. But it got beyond that. And I said to myself, okay, if that's the case, we're in the pit. And I'm also looking at in this current moment um, where I'm not really looking at charts, I'm just really watching the action. And at the time, I, not only was I in the pit, I was looking at my e mini uh, SP market looking into the pit. And so I didn't have charts, but all I could see was the book. And so I would just write down my levels or I'd print up a chart and I'd say, these are the unfinished extreme areas. Because let's remember what a Fed uh, move does. A Fed move does the extremes, right? It touches the extremes. It gives you the prices that you may not think you had a chance to get in or to get out. It's not typically something where it stays really inside a range and you have a lot of volume um, at very few prices. It's it's volume that's spread out. The liquidity dries up and we go to prices to find where the liquidity steps in, right? Because it's not like every other, uh, every big trader out there is working orders and they're just, so the market's going to move until there's interest. And so I looked for what, once again, unfinished business. And so I would start off at my dailies and I'd say, okay, kind of where are we? And what I started to do was I would mark off, let me go back in my tool. I'm getting better at this with this F6 on Ninja Trader. You just click that and you can draw a horizontal line. Look at that. I mean, it's impressive how far I've come. Um, and then I would box out all of the peaks and say, look at these peaks and say, if the market were to blip up or down to any of these peaks, that's what I would consider unfinished business because if you look at these times where the market was going up, that three standard deviation to the high or the low that of that peak, that is where the market turned back down and we didn't get like that really strong move up to get that Bollinger Band, right? So it didn't really get up there and get it and the Bollinger Band started to revert back in. So I would look at those and I would say, these are my daily extreme areas. If we were to blip up or down to any one of these, I would step in, right? I would step in with a small position and hopefully there'd be a reaction that I would like and I would step in and trade them. And then on the daily, they'd be really wide, right? Then I would take and I would go down to my shorter term chart and I would say, okay, still want that three standard deviation. And anytime you're looking at, I have a 30 minute up here, which I which I like uh, is really probably more of my go-to one when I'm looking at the Fed. I'll, I'll, I'll go to a 30-minute or, or a 60-minute chart, and I really have been using the 30-minute a lot more lately. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with that one for today. And what I would do is the same thing. I would go back and look at peaks, and I would say what's the highest peak on a strong move, and I would say what was the lowest peak 
uh, on a strong move lower. And I would say, okay, those areas are areas of interest to me, right? And so you go back and this big March 16th timeframe, you have the strong move higher, markets started to get sideways, Bollinger Bands peaked all the way up to there. And then they started to come back down the strong move lower. You had a peak here. And now I basically box out a range that's going to be a lot tighter than what I'm seeing in the uh, in the daily. And I look at that and I say, wow, look at that. There's a peak there and there's a peak there that are pretty similar. And you say to yourself, okay, if the market blips up to here, especially if it gets above a three standard deviation on my 30 minute. What I say, usually on most time frames, a three standard deviation for the S&P, you're going to see some sort of mean reversion. Very seldom, uh, very rarely is it just staying above it and staying pinned above it, right? You don't really know uh, when it'll come off, right? You hope it comes off relatively quickly. But when you look at it, you go back and say, that's an area of interest. And so to me, that's how I developed the level. So this area came in just right around 40, 70. And you look to see the other day where we went up and made that high and we got just above that. And then we started to come back down. And that's where I would look at my first level of resistance or support, because that's that unfinished business. It's funny how markets go back to when, I'm not saying they're going back to this specific time, but in some ways I'm saying that, um, where the market was going up and it could have easily gone and had this three standard deviation move, but it just wasn't ready yet. And so time goes by, time goes by. You see that that peak was never taken out, even when the moves higher started to go up. And so that area, as you start to see multiple peaks, start to become an area of interest because that's what I considered unfinished business to the upside. That's a good high, right? And so now you look at this market and you say, wow, that was a pretty good high. Um, and you won't wait to see, You know, obviously, as time goes by, you have this peak up here now um, where we have this one. And that's unfinished business on net strong of a move, just like this one right here is unfinished business to the downside. And so then I start to look at it and I start to say, okay, you know, I'll probably take this one off. I take this one off. And now this peak, because we had such a strong move higher and lower, this is where I think the unfinished business is. And so we, I would just call these basically extensions, right? Extensions of the range to where we thought we would go. And I would give these to everybody on their cards and there'd be a whole group of us, we would look at them. And then, you know, we would even say, you know, Anthony, maybe let's take them down the time frame a little bit. Maybe we wanna see some other ones on a shorter time frame. Uh, maybe I would go to like, you know, let's take this down to like, maybe we go to like a 15 minute or something, right? And say, um, what does that look like? You know, and I would say, oh, I'm not, not much difference here, you know, in the 15 minute and so on and so forth. And what we would look for is just those, oh, that's actually a 15 second. I want to, I need to go to a 15 minute. I'm like, man, that doesn't look right. There you yeah. go. But you get the gist of it. And that's what we would yeah. look at. And we'd say, oh, wow, look at this one. This one's almost the same on the 15 minute now as the 30 minute. And that's pretty interesting. And we would start to see where that would be that unfinished business areas. So if we were to see spikes higher or lower, um, these areas are areas that we would step in. And so that's how we did it. So what's interesting, if we go back to that 30 minute, Anthony, what I liked about that is that level that um, we looked at uh, with um, that we hit yesterday, you you had identified two areas. You saw March 16th and you saw March 21st, let's say, those two areas. And there are different dynamics happening those days, right? One is on a very big uptrend in March 16th and March 22nd is consolidation, yet they indicated kind of the same area, right? And all it took was an event of sorts, in this case, the FOMC reporting and then uh, the press conference after to push it to that level. So it's almost like saying, hey, you know what? Here's an interesting level. Yeah, we're we're a ways away from it March 16th. You know, March 21st, hey, here's another interesting level. By the way, it corresponds with the, the 16th level. And, you know, we're sideways motion, right? But it's kind of setting up for when you do have a big event, pushing it over uh, uh, pushing that momentum over whatever you want to call it, that price action over to that level. And now you've got a new new level with uh, last night's or this morning's activity with those uh, standard deviation bands at 4,100 in the top and 3,900 at the bottom. It's almost like, okay, where are we going next? 
Yeah, it just it's I can't say this enough that the market the market looks for a high until it finds a high. The market looks for a low until it finds a low. And the market gets in these modes, right? And so when a market's grinding in an area and then you have the mean reversion, what it does with the Bollinger Bands, what I think with the extensions, is that it shows the the, the velocity, the power of the, the, the potential of that move, right? And so it sets up with these peaks the potential to go to these areas on the upside and these areas on the downside. And so during a Fed meeting, your typical support and resistance levels that you just would draw the lines on, uh, you know, what look, this is support here and this is resistance. At those times, the market already knows of that high and low. So you're basically, it's just, it's like the Pac-Man searching for, for stops, right? So it's going to go, and it's just going to gobble them up. And so you don't really like those areas of support and resistance, right? Because you're, you have the same information that everybody else has and everyone knows, oh, if it takes out that high by a tick or a low by a tick, it's going to run. But how far is it going to run? And what was the potential before when you had a strong move? So this gives us the visual to box it in and say, hey, I think if we run off, this could be an unfinished business area where there was a lot of room actually for that room for that to rally. And you can see there, they they tried to do it on the 21st, couldn't do it. Peak was almost the same, came right off, right? Then eventually it got the, the momentum it needed and goes, ah, we did it, right? And then boom, it comes right off. And it's kind of weird, uh, you know, and, I, and I'm saying this kind of, kind of in a fun way, but it's that's what I've seen happen over and over and over and over and over and over again. And it was one of those things where I was going back and looking at, you even look at like even this one up in here, you know, some of these extreme times you say, oh yeah, um, this one's even a possibility if we were maybe to take out, um, you know, this recent high, it can maybe similar to what uh, this peak would be, right? And then you look and say, those are my extreme levels because the market's showing at times when it's going towards this area, that that's the velocity of the move. That's the three standard deviation away from the high, right? And so it goes back to, can it do a four or five standard deviation move? Sure. It's, but that would be, you know, very, very rare. And does it do two standard deviation moves? Why not use that? Well, those are just much more common. Three is kind of that sweet spot where it's like, it's just a good enough high in the S&P to where I could step in and fade it. Right. You know, with a two standard deviation move, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I, I doubt it. And with a four and five, it's like, it's so rare, you probably get one or two a year. Right. Maybe. And so that's why I also, I know people are probably going to say, well, why use the three standard deviation? And that's the reason I like it because it's just enough for you to just get uh, that reaction you're looking for. Right. The, you know, you think about a three standard deviation move. If you're, if you're going to fade that move, you know, odds are it's not going to go to a four or five standard deviation move. It could happen, but four and five standard deviation moves are so rare, right? They're, you know, less than 5%, maybe less than 2%. So you're looking at 2%, it goes against you and 98%, it goes with you in terms of those kind of, of deviation moves. It's, you know, like I said, past performance, not indicative, and you do have to put in stops and all of that. But then just by the definition of a third standard deviation move, it's very likely that it'll revert. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting about today's action, let's talk a little bit about it is, so one thing that I'm looking at was looking at yesterday. And this is why I like the 30 minute chart for this. I think it's a really good chart. And I'm going to just move this to there. I'm going to delete this one because I just want to keep it clean. This is something I really keep an eye on. When I look at this right now and I say, okay, we didn't get overbought on the RSI, even on that higher move, right? We go and get oversold. Market expands again. And what's the market doing? It's hunting for a higher Bollinger Band peak again. The market continues to search for a high, right? It doesn't. It didn't love this high, even though for the short term, it was a good high. We're day traders anyway. 
the market is searching for a high. Like right now it's getting extended, sitting above a three standard deviation move, as I talked about. I said, you don't see it too often. We'll see how the day unfolds, especially a day after an FOMC meeting. You could tend to see us holding and hugging potentially a three standard deviation Bollinger Band on a 30 minute chart. It's not that big of a deal. I wouldn't be using this as mean reversion uh, at all. I'm just saying that, you know, the market is still uncertain that that high is the high to trade off of. Because remember something, when highs and lows are made that the market really likes, the traders start to trade off of those highs and lows. And what I mean by that is if this high was really good, you would see the sellers come in today and really push to take out this low because now they have a fixed area of risk. All right. I go back to the end of last year and the beginning of this year, and I talked about how I was long Tesla and how I was long some NASDAQ, and I was even long the S&P. And I said, at this point, although I may think that we're still in a bear market, even though I was long, the risk became easier to manage because it felt like we had a good low. And sometimes you just need to see that, right? And these Bollinger Bands for these extreme types of, um, when I see these peaks, it tells me a lot because the fact today that we're going and holding the upper three standard deviation Bollinger Band after a day like yesterday, where you kind of, you pierce both sides, it's telling me that the market's still searching for a high. It doesn't love it. Agreed. Agreed. And, you know, we talk about Bollinger Bands coming out of uh, consolidating uh, areas like earlier today, uh, like earlier this morning. There can be a tendency when you get up to that third standard deviation band, you're right, it isn't always mean reverting. There is sometimes where when those bands open up, it is exactly what you said. The market's looking to get back to that high. It's looking to, is it 4,100 today? Who knows? Is it 4,060? Take out yesterday's high of 4,080? Who knows? But you know, right now, trading the now, as you say, looking at the price hugging that upper Bollinger band, I'm certainly not bearish just because we're hitting a third standard deviation band. The range is too tight. Exactly. And when you look up here, to me, this is that unfinished business area, 4075-ish to 4110. And if it starts to take out that high, people say, well, how far can it go? That's where I would look. So it's not just F and FOMC day. I would also look at this and say on any sort of extreme move, which I still think, I always believe day one and day two of the FOMC or any major new news event, I always say day one is the overreaction. Day two is the reaction to day one. Day three is when we find out what the tape truly did take in from what the, what the announcement of the news was. And so day two, they're reacting to it. They're saying this sell-off was an opportunity to buy. That, that's basically what the market's saying. And we don't love this high and we're searching for it. Now, whether they get there and take it out over the next couple of days, who knows? But the bottom line is what it's telling us at this exact moment is that. I love it. I love it. And, you know, we could talk about divergence with the RSI, RSI yesterday, right? We saw divergence making new highs and not making new highs on the yeah. RSI. And, you know, yeah. now we're, 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 we're in agreement with the RSI. So another you know, uh, reason to say these aren't mean reverting Bollinger Bands. Um, no, exactly. Know and, and, and just to show everybody what uh, what we're talking about with that, I mean, you look at it here and that's what we're saying. So what you're saying is you're seeing price go up. Uh, I don't have the line up there again. Price go up, you can see that. And then as you're getting divergence with the RSI and then today you get the blow or yesterday you get the blow off low and now we're back in line with it. That's what Tom and I just were, were referring to. Yeah, thanks for that. And I know um, you probably want to have something to talk about. Uh, yeah, I, I, this is this is something I think that everybody should really take interest in is if you are uh, an active trader and you want to go out there and test your skills against other traders, CME Group is holding a WTI futures trading challenge, especially if you're interested in trading crude oil. It's a great way to go in and go in there and test yourself against a bunch of other traders. Um, there's a link in my description on my YouTube page. I know we had some issues today with the feed. It didn't go to my YouTube page, uh, but we will put this out there later. Um, and I will actually be putting a tweet about this as well. And you just go to this page and you can sign up and you can see it's a competition from the March 26th to March 31st. And first place pays 2,500, second place 1,500, third place 850. It's 
actual dollars that they're paying. <laughs> um, you get all all the details around here, but you can go in and trade WTI crude oil. Um, I think you're going to learn a lot. They've got some great videos. It's all in the simulator. It doesn't cost you anything to join. Uh, and you go in there and do it. And I think that, you know, it's it's just, it's not only is it uh, something to help you brush up on your skills and learn something about crude oil, but you have the potential. If you do well, you win some money. Oh, that sounds exciting. I didn't I didn't know about this. Um, yeah, that's great. And where can people find you? I know you mentioned your YouTube channel. Uh, where else can people find you? Yeah, just go to add Anthony Crudelli on Twitter. And then if you go to my YouTube channel and you can see where today's show will be, we'll, like we said, we'll update the video later on there, but the link is in that bio. Uh, and, and I will put a tweet out about this as well. So pretty much everything flows through uh, Anthony Crudelli Twitter. Just look at Anthony Crudelli. Don't even you just search it. Google it, right? Just Google the name. I don't think hopefully there's not two Anthony's. There can't I've got be, right? so many fakes out there on everywhere. It's uh, just make sure it's the right one. <laughs> right. The blue check. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Anthony. It's always a great, great time when we talk and you know, great meeting you in person this week. It was the highlight of the week so far. It's not over yet, but it was the highlight of the week to come and come by and see your studio, really. No, it was great having you guys uh, and, and everybody out there. Busy week, busy times. Make sure your work and stops. This market is violent. And, and all I could say is, is that, you know, when things start to get like this, you got to be conscious to put those stops in. I, I've been seeing some stories on Twitter. You know, we always talk about managing risk as traders, but make sure you got those stops in uh, during these times, man. You don't know what kind of news could hit this tape. That's right. That's right. A good, good advice. Um, want to remind everybody that we have a special edition of See the Futures with Blue Putnam. Jim Cagnina is going to be hosting that. That comes up at noon Eastern, and then I will be closing out the day with bars closing. Again, Anthony, thanks so much, and uh, we'll see everybody next week. See everybody.